Well, actually, there's quite a bit to tell. Um, really, over the last probably five years, we've had a lot more research in this. Um, I actually first looked at this issue back in 1990. Uh, and back at the time that I first looked at it, there was only basically one article, and it said that women's birth experience did not impact their emotional health. Because uh, mainly, when you looked at what the article did, is they actually went through and just looked at charts. You know, they didn't talk to the mothers. And so they, they looked at really objective factors, how long the labor lasted, what kinds of interventions, number of interventions. Uh, but they didn't ask any questions like, did she think she was going to die? Um, you know, did she feel that people were mean to her or unkind in the hospital? I mean, those are the variables that actually really make a difference, and they didn't ask that. And so, I, you know, I knew back even then that they got it wrong because I just heard too many mothers' stories. You know, when you started seeing these stories circulating around in the literature, mothers describing their births in these horrific terms, you know, talking about their birth having been like a rape. Um, you know, so that got my attention. And so when I wrote the first book on postpartum depression, so that book came out in uh, end of 92, um, I actually had to borrow a model from the family violence field. I'm a family violence researcher, and I had to borrow a model from that field to be able to even talk about, you know, how women might possibly be impacted by their birth. And I had interviewed a bunch of women in the book, and so again, I tried to kind of match it up with some of the constructs I was putting forward. Uh, so, you know, again, we were having to sort of pull from other literatures. Um, you know, and then, you know, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, we had a few studies, but it wasn't the sort of tremendous number we have now. And so I actually had a birth trauma talk, and I kind of stopped doing it after a while because I didn't really feel like we had that much more new to say. That has absolutely changed. Uh, we have a much better uh, understanding of it now, and we've got really good studies from all over the world uh, showing that certain things tend to be more predictive of birth trauma. Uh, one of the things that was kind of a surprise is, you know, always before we based our research on, you know, cesarean versus vaginal, you know, so the vaginal births were the good ones and the cesareans were bad. Well, you know, I knew subjectively that just wasn't the case. Some cesareans actually can be really quite nice, you know, they can ha be handled very well and the mother does really well with them. Um, some vaginal births women have described as rapes. You know, so again, to just have that, you know, vaginal versus cesarean really wasn't sort of capturing. Uh, and now actually one of the things that they found in the more recent studies is, yes, emergency C-sections can cause um, major reactions in the moms, but so can forceps deliveries, especially if there's any kind of laceration or tearing. And the more severe that is, the more likely that is to cause symptoms. Uh, but I still go back to kind of a model that I learned originally when I first started looking at this. I was reading Charles Figley's book, uh, Trauma in Its Wake. It's kind of one of the seminal books in the trauma field. It was published in the 1980s. And he's a combat guy. I actually know Charles uh, now. I didn't then. But um, he, you know, he said, and he thought, I thought it was really very relevant to what we were looking at with birth. You know, he was trying to kind of pull together this book. It was kind of the first major work on post-traumatic stress disorder. So he had chapters on things like people who'd survived natural disasters or who'd been sexually assaulted um, or who'd been in the Holocaust um, and or who'd been in combat. And so again, trying to kind of pull, you know, these are very different experiences, but what were the commonalities? And he said that an event will be troubling to the extent that it is sudden, dangerous, and overwhelming. And I think right there, you really kind of captured some of the subjective responses that mothers may have uh, when they talk about their births. You know, so again, you know, that's a, that's a story I hear over and over and over again from moms. They'll tell me, you know, that things were going fine and then they were suddenly bad. You know, one mom in my book, I think her, you know, things were going okay, they ruptured her membranes and then she had a prolapse cord and it became an instantly a medical emergency. You know, so she had both the sudden and the dangerous aspect and then it was overwhelming. They ended up having to put her under general anesthesia. You know, but just the hospital environment itself can be overwhelming for pretty much everybody there, you know, who's not staff. Um, so again, I think sudden, dangerous, and overwhelming really describes that. But it is really a, actually amazing, you know, how, how much better the research has gotten, the big samples. Uh, the thing that's really scary is the percentage of women with symptoms. Uh, and that's something we didn't really have data on before. Um, right now, actually, according to the listening to the mother survey, a big survey Lamaze did, we're at 9% of women meeting full criterion for post-traumatic stress disorder and another 18% actually having symptoms. And when you break that up by ethnicity, African-American women are, you know, something like 26% of them were likely to have symptoms. You know, that's really bad. You know, when you think 9%, you think, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. But when you realize that people after September 11th living in lower Manhattan, only 7.5% 
met full criterion for post-traumatic stress disorder. We're talking about 9% versus 7.9%, that's, or 7.5%, that's a bad, that's a bad number. Uh, and so again, like I said, I'm really surprised at how common and pervasive these effects are, and I don't think actually we're doing anything really to address it right now. So the relationship between birth trauma and breastfeeding um, is, is important to also consider. And again, I think that this is a piece we're not addressing, um, and I think it's a shame. Uh, one of the things that we know from research you know, down in, let's say, Guatemala, there's a big study down there, is that a traumatic birth can actually delay lactogenesis, or sort of when the milk comes in, uh, by as much as several days. And so then, I've seen a lot of mothers kind of get into trouble because here they are and they're trying to kind of breastfeed and maybe the baby's a little sleepy um, and they're trying to, you know, bring in their milk supply and all of a sudden their milk's not there, baby's weight starts, you know, dropping, the baby gets maybe some jaundice, I mean, and it just can create this whole sort of cascade. And I think if we kind of understand that, we understand the physiology of what happens when people are put in extremely stressful positions. Uh, then we, will con we can, I think, take steps as lactation consultants to step in and do something about that. Uh, for one thing, you know, I would probably, with a mom like that, work to see if she can tolerate skin to skin. Sometimes moms, if they've been through really traumatic things, have a hard time with that. But if she can tolerate skin to skin, I'd probably be promoting that. I might even think about maybe having her do some pumping, just to kind of see if we can maybe bring that milk in, you know, on time instead of delayed. Uh, the other thing is, too, I think sometimes if you know that's coming, you can plan for it. So you can watch it when that baby starts getting into a little bit of trouble, you know, and maybe start doing just a, you know, a small thing of supplementation just to kind of get that baby over the hump while the mom brings her milk supply in. You know, so again, I think being proactive. Uh, the other thing I was really struck by is how disturbing it was in the literature to read about how many of the mothers felt disconnected from their babies, not just for days or weeks, but in some cases years. And it's like, that is something I think we need to intervene on. You know, we might say, well, you know, she can't handle it. You know, we need to actually very gently, but, you know, firmly say, you know, she needs to, we need to help facilitate that connection between her and her baby. Uh, because if we don't, it's not just for the baby's sake. She needs that. You know, it's, she has to have a relationship with this baby and I think she'll feel like she really missed something you know, if she's not able to sort of forge that. You know, and oftentimes having the relationship with the baby can be healing toward the experience. And so again, I think that that's something sometimes, I think sometimes we're afraid to kind of, you know, be forthright with mothers. You know, but one of the things I recommended that, you know, that we say is something like, you know, I know that you're having a really hard time right now, but right now your baby needs you and we need to see how we can make that so it's okay for both of you. You know, and maybe think about doing some infant massage, um, you know, some mother infant coaching, some other kinds of things uh, if she's not breastfeeding and to help her make that connection with her baby. Because I think it really is something that she would lose out on and I think grieve for. You know, so again, I think it's a place where I think we need to step in.